Uh, welcome, everybody. We're about 30 seconds before the hour here. Um, we're going to get going at about a minute or two after 10. Uh, we have a great group of presenters here. I just wanted to uh, let you guys know about a few new resources while we're waiting for people to log on. Um, LSNTAP has launched a new website. Um, it is on the DLAW platform. Uh, we have transferred over our 100 most popular pieces of content from the old website. Uh, if there's anything that you can't find, just a second. Did you come back in 30? Or sorry, 45. Thank you. Okay, I'm back. Uh, the hazards of doing things uh, remotely. I'm actually out at the statewide legal training conference here in Washington State uh, doing today's uh, webinar from my room here. Uh, and I forgot to put up the do not disturb, but we will be in good shape now. Um, so we have a new website. Uh, which has about all of our most popular content. If you're looking for any of the old content, please just send us an email and we will uh, expedite transferring over those particular pieces of content. Uh, we're going through all of our old content. We ha have about 12 years of content dating back to 2006. Um, updating links and seeing if they are still relevant. Some of them definitely were not. Uh, our YouTube channel is still prominently displayed here and I highly recommend checking it out. We have our last three years worth of training all archived and uh, almost 200 free videos for the legal services community over there. Uh, today's training is being recorded. We will have a copy of it available on YouTube within a week along with a blog post that summarizes it. Um, and we will also share the slides uh, at that time. Um, thank you all so much for uh, coming out to this. I'm turning it over at this point to Laura Quinn, who is the organizer for this. Hey guys, it's great to be here with you. Let me, oh, I just did something weird for sharing. Hang on just a second. Um, I'm going to share my slides with you. Uh, this oh. this looks good. We can see your screen. Or, Perfect. Yeah, we can see your screen. Um, it, it, luckily, it defaulted to what it had done before. Um, fantastic. So we're going to be talking today about what we're calling baking evaluation into your technology projects. And we'll talk about what that means. So the idea of it in, in, um, in general is to, instead of thinking of evaluation as its own kind of stream where you come around to it at the end of the project, to think of it as something that is designed into every project so it can be a continuous improvement process. Um, so I am Laura Quinn. Um, I am the, uh, I'm the principal of Laura Quinn Consulting, not a very descriptive um, uh, definition. I am an independent consultant specializing in uh, technology research and design for access to justice. Uh, I'm working with the Florida Justice Technology Center right now, as well as the, um, a few organizations in Illinois doing an assessment of the uh, Illinois Legal Aid Online triage system, as well as working with um, an organization that you'll see a case study from, um, the, um, the new Ohio Legal Help, so a completely redesigned Ohio Legal Help. Uh, and I'm really excited to have two other people with me on the line. Um, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, first, Zach, you want to say a little about yourself? Sure, thanks. I'm the program director at the Illinois Equal Justice Foundation, which is a role I've had for going on four years now. And I work with uh, uh, legal aid organizations across Illinois. We're a funder, so we fund legal aid programs. And then occasionally we pick up extra kind of access to justice projects and initiatives, including the Illinois Armed Forces Legal Aid Network, which I'll tell you about in a few minutes. Terrific. And Brandon Thomas is here with us from the Florida Justice Technology Center. Brandon, you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Laura. Um, so my name is Brandon, and I'm a, actually an analyst and developer for the Florida Justice Technology Center. And I'm involved in creating a lot of sites. Uh, you'll see one today in my presentation, uh, Florida Name Change, uh, a sites that, micro sites that kind of address certain legal issues. 
And then I'm also um, in charge of Google Analytics and a lot of the reporting that we create and develop in the organization. And we'll show you guys some of that later today as well. Fantastic. All right, my esteemed group of panelists. Um, what are we going to talk about today? So we're I'm going to give a bit of an intro um, to kind of the frame for this conversation. So kind of thinking through the term evaluation, which is actually a term I really don't like very much. <laughs> and I try to push back against people who want to do kind of program evaluation of technology. Um, versus kind of the idea of baking met in metrics. Um, and we'll all talk about kind of what that might look like. Uh, and then we'll do three fairly detailed case studies. Um, so Florida Name Change, uh, Illinois Armed Forces Legal Aid Network um, and the brand new Ohio Legal Help. I'm um, going look at the metrics. So basically how all three of these um, uh, sites are using, they're all in the name, in fact, are all three websites, um, how they are using metrics for a continuous improvement process. Um, and we'll end up with some questions and answers. Certainly you can ask, please feel free to ask questions at any time during the chat. Um, and we will certainly take them as they come, especially as they apply to what we're talking about right in the moment. Um, we'll also have, I think, a little bit of time for a bit of a panel discussion at the end um, where I will ask some questions of our presenters, or certainly I'm happy to ask your, your questions of um, our presenters um, and to kind of wrap up this whole theme. So let us dive in. So kind of thinking of this overall concept. So, I think way too often in our day-to-day -day work, evaluation is something that you come to at the end of, you know, a year-long cycle, a two-year cycle, a three-year cycle, and you're like, crap, what am I supposed to be doing again? I need to provide a report um, as per this cartoon year, which I like. Um, so, and this is, it's really ineffective for a lot of ways. And I would argue that one of the most important reasons that it's not effective is it doesn't actually help you to improve anything. So at this point, the, this kind of report that you can imagine that this woman in this, you know, presumably a program evaluator will be getting out of this exercise that they're about to do, it's going to be hard to actually uh, make as nearly as many improvements as one might like to see um, based on that. It's going to be more of a busy work exercise, unfortunately. So kind of in more detail um, what this might look like. So pretty much every proposal these days has a, um, asks for a, at least a quick overview of what you might measure in, in a proposal. Um, and it's pretty easy to throw some things in there that will sound impressive. <laughs> I've done this myself. Um, and then maybe there's a more detailed plan for a funder, which is kind of think through, well, what do people do here? It's so early. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do. Um, and then you design and you build and you roll out your system. And then you get down the and down to the end of the road. You get, you know, two years later, and you're, you're like, crap, what were we supposed to measure again? What are, what are we doing? What, what, and, and it becomes a, you know, a really annoying exercise to try to put this whole thing together. So I would propose instead the idea of baking the metrics into the process. And this is certainly not a new idea from me, um, but kind of, conceptually the idea that you're going to, you're still going to need a quick eval plan for your proposal um, and you're probably going to be early enough in the process that it's going to be hard to know precisely what metrics might make sense, but you can kind of take a, take a stab at it for the proposal. And then you're going to design a chunk of the system, which includes not just the not only the design for the system, but you're going to design the metrics in, to help you uh, measure that piece of the system. You're then going to build this piece, you're going to measure that, that piece, and you're going to iterate. Um, and each of these pieces might only be, you know, four months, six months. They're going to be a much smaller um, chunk than like a whole two-year project. And then at some point, you're able to report, create a report for a funder 
out of already existing metrics. So the report becomes a essentially a write-up of things you already know. So you've already done, you know, potentially three iterations, um, and you know how things are going. You write that up for the funder, as opposed to that being the, that report being the driver of everything you're learning. Um, so this general idea is um, continuous improvement or a performance management process. So it depends on which uh, world you're coming out of. This is continuous improvement out of the corporate world, uh, performance management out of the evaluation world. Uh, it also gets pretty close to a kind of more of the idea of an agile um, uh, developing um, uh, methodology out of the um, programming world. Uh, so like I said, this is not at all a unique concept to me. But it has a lot of benefits. So you don't need to scramble to figure out how the system is doing at the last minute. Uh, it also, there's no big one-time outlay of expense. So instead of thinking of evaluation as a, either, so either in my experience, you have it as a big chunk of money, you know, like a $20,000 or a $40,000 outlay at the end of a two-year project, or you have it as you know, a small outlay of money that isn't nearly enough money to actually know anything. So you have a $5,000 evaluation, but that's not enough to actually really understand the things you might want to understand. As you go through time, you can refine your metrics as, as well as your design. So you can say, all right, well, these things that we're measuring are not as useful as what we might measure. Let's refine those. Um, you can um, look at the data that you're gathering and understand things about your data cleanliness or other things that really will inform upon how you're collecting your data. Um, and you accumulate data before you have to report. One of the actual, really actually tricky problems, as uh, from, coming from me as someone who has done a reasonable number of technology evaluations, is at the end, so if we do a two-year project and we roll out the project in August and we have to submit a evaluation report in October, there is very little data on how the system has actually done in the real world and it's very difficult to actually say anything uh, because there's simply not enough time and enough volume of data to really know how it's doing. Um, so there's a big benefit in doing the smaller chunks um, which is that you uh, you have more data in hand to be able to say things that are more compelling um, in your final evaluation. All right, so that is my overview of kind of this whole kind of concept and thought process that we're going to be thinking through and kind of to to focus in in each of the case studies. Any questions or thoughts on, on any of that? Does resonate, not resonate for anybody on the line into the chat? So just to remind people, there's two ways to ask questions. One of those is uh, raise your hand, which there's a little hand icon on your control panel. The other is there's a question area. If you type something into the questions, we'll be monitoring it the whole time. I just also wanted to say that I, I strongly agree with that more agile-like um, way of doing things, that iterative process that includes evaluation again and again can have really positive outcomes, especially when um, user testing is part of that. Great. All right, let's dive into a case study from, uh, from the Florida Justice Technology Center, the Florida Name Change website. Um, so Brandon, take it away. Great, uh, thanks Laura. Um, so before we kind of dive into this case study and look at the metrics and the reportings we developed, I wanted to kind of let you guys all know what Florida Name Change is. Uh, so Florida Name Change is a website that we developed um, to help Florid Floridians illegally update their name and gender marker. And um, basically what we did when we 
were looking at developing this website is the transgender community was our cornerstone, kind of our target user for the site, because we figured that if we build something that can change both your name and your gender marker, and if it worked well for them, we can also get the general, you know, name change users as well. So if we build for that, that one audience, um, we can catch everybody else as well, because um, it kind of meets their needs also. And, um, and what this website basically does is it helps people generate uh, legal forms, uh, PDF forms that we email to them. Um, and we do it for the Florida name change petition, for the birth certificate updates, you know, for Florida, and also for federal social security and U.S. passport documents. And um, as we said earlier, why, the question, why did we focus on the transgender community? Um, one of the things we found in our research is there's over 100,000 transgender individuals that live in Florida. But also, um, 68,000 of these individuals have never updated their identification documents. And that's basically 68% of them. So there's a large community there to work with. But also, one of the things that kind of really spoke to us on this as well is the transgender community, um, there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of vulnerability there. They're, they're at risk for discrimination and violence because if their IDs and their documentation uh, show a gender that they do not identify as, um, you know, there's a lot of people out there that have questions about that. And so this really is also helping them solve a problem that, that keeps discrimination and violence from affecting someone's life. And that, that's kind of why we focused on them for this project. Okay, and then, so before we kind of dive in, I wanted to kind of give you guys um, also kind of just a quick look of kind of what our technology looks like on Florida Name Change. Um, so what we've kind of got here is if you guys look at the left side of the screen, is we've kind of, uh, you know, screenshot what one of our landing pages looks like for the site. And like in this particular case, it's the, uh, the disclosure for non-lawyer legal form for the name change position. And so kind of what this site does is it kind of puts everything into kind of a bite size kind of info and instructional page for each form. And we kind of lead you, you know, um, one, one page at a time through the process. So it's very easy to understand. And then what you guys will see on the right-hand side of the screen is, you know, once you click that fill out form on the left-hand side, we actually are using a, a technology called Typeform, where we'll actually, you know, load up and bring you into a, uh, another, once again, you know, bite-sized autofill, you know, form process. So it'll, it'll start them you know, at the beginning of the form. And then if you follow the arrow to the bottom on the right side, you'll see we kind of will lead them through a question-by-question uh, question process of filling out their information. And then at the end of the day, um, we will send them a, uh, an email with that PDF form, and uh, they've got all their legal documents filled out from the site. So kind of, kind of with a kind of better understanding and visual there on how the site works, now we'll kind of start going into the reporting and how we're kind of measuring the effectiveness of it. Okay, so when we were developing, um, looking at developing and reporting for Florida name change, we kind of asked ourselves some of these questions. And you'll kind of see in my standard items questions here, you know, these are the things that everybody wants to know, right? Well, how many visitors are coming to my site? How often are these visitors coming back to my site? You know, where are they coming to me from? Are they coming from Google? Are they coming from Facebook? Or are they coming from other referring sites? You know, where are we getting users? And then we're also wanting to know about, right, their demographics, um, their gender, their age group, those basic things. And then also, you know, are they coming to us from a desktop or are they coming from a mobile device? You know, kind of what technology are we building for? And then also at the bottom here, though, there was some, some enhanced items that we also wanted to know. And these are really the items, you know, where the top items kind of tell us our popularity, right, and kind of if we're drawing people, these bottom items actually tell us, are we converting them? Are we actually doing some good? And the, those are those some of the key things we really wanted to know. And so kind of, for example, on the, the first one, you know, how popular is each page on the site? You know, and are visitors actually interacting with them? You know, do we see them scrolling and, you know, looking at content? And if they're going from one page to the next, are they dropping off? You know, are we losing them somewhere? So those type of things were very important to us to know also. And then the, the second question on the enhanced items, you know, how many legal form packets are being completed by visitors? And that kind of goes for us to the heart of the site, right? So not only are we attracting X number of people to the site, are they actually completing paperwork, you know, that would actually let them file their legal documents, you know, and change their name or gender. So that, that question kind of goes to the heart of the site for us. 
And then kind of on the third item here, one of the things we wanted to know is how effective are our interview processes for each automated form? You know, or not only are we, are we drawing people to the form, you know, are we getting people through them? And are there any actual, uh, you know, uh, issues there that we can improve upon? And so those are definitely all the things that we kind of asked ourselves going into this. And um, one of the things I'll kind of add for you guys as well too, is when we were developing out the reporting technology for Florida name change, we were actually kind of doing the same thing for our organization as a whole. So this 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 slide here is kind of hopefully interesting to some of you guys if you're looking to build, you know, a reporting Muted. technology in a platform. This is kind of kind of some of the technology we're using. So kind of starting on the left hand side, you'll see well we're using Google Analytics. Um, we've got Google Analytics piped into all of our site. Um, it's definitely the de facto standard you know, for knowing what's going on with your site. Um, we're using using it with Tag Manager, so one piece of code goes on our site, and that's all we have to do with it. It's nice and easy. And then kind of looking at these three middle boxes here from Analytics Edge to SheetGo, is then what we're doing is we're actually using Analytics Edge, which is a, a small Excel plugin, to go against, you go out there and fetch information from Google Analytics on all of our sites on a daily basis, and then it's pulling that down for us so we can actually consume it into a database. In our particular case, um, we're using Microsoft's uh, SQL, you know, Azure database. And, and my, my background, I originally came from the corporate world, so I worked with SQL Server a lot, so that was kind of the reason we chose that. But, you know, you could use, you know, BigQuery, you could use Cloud SQL, you know, you could use a lot of other, you know, databases as kind of a middle, you know, a gathering place for this if you wanted to. And then, then lastly, we're, um, we're also then, once we or using Azure database to actually put our reports together, we're using a technology on here called SheetGo that actually allows us to then take that information out of the Microsoft you know, world and put it back into the Google world. So we can, um, at the end of the day, we're feeding, uh, as you'll see on the right-hand side, we're feeding Google Data Studio as kind of our visualization layer. Um, and the nice thing about that is our organization uses G Suite for our emails and a lot of other things. So it, using Google Data Studio, it's a free a visualization platform. It's really easy to use, and it's also really easy to administer and share because it just plugs right into what we do for G Suite already. And so I know this kind of a kind of a whirlwind overview of that, but um, the cool thing is um, we were able to build out a very comprehensive reporting platform for our uh, nine plus sites, and we are basically only spending two hundred and eighty dollars a year in tools to do that. So I think it's a great example that organizations looking to build comprehensive reporting, you can do it, and you can do it with a very realistic budget. Great. Brandon, can you just say a little bit about why you're pulling data out of the, the Google world just to put it back into the Google world? Are there multiple data sources that you're combining? So the, the main reason why, and, and actually uh, there, there are multiple data sources we are, per, we are combining. Um, we are getting all the data from Google Analytics. We're also getting... Um, data from Typeform, which is our uh, form technology we're using. So there are several pieces of data we're putting together. But then also it, it gives us a lot more flexibility because we're able to create certain views and certain slices of reporting, you know, very easily uh, to create, you know, custom reports on our own to tell us different things that it is not as easy to do in the Google Analytics world. Great. Thank you. Okay, so the next thing, next thing we're going to do um, here for you guys is we're going to kind of take you through our uh, kind of our standard reporting suite that we developed for Florida name change, and then this is also consistent, you know, with our other FJTC sites. So we're putting together a lot of consistent data for our different sites, and we're not going to show you every report that we do, um, but we're going to kind of cover probably some of the highlights here that are relevant to what we're talking about today. So this. Uh, this first report you guys are looking at, um, we're looking at the number of weekly visitors that come to the site, right? This is a fairly standard report, kind of see how the site's popularity is, how it's growing, or how it's you know, possibly declining over time. And then we're kind of seeing on here that, like for this particular case, new and returning visitors. Uh, this was a very interesting data point for us on this site because we had, um, you know, seven plus forms to fill out in the name change process, and some of them are quite large. So a lot of times we've got users kind of coming and going, and it's kind of good for us to kind of see what that interchange is. 
Um, and this next report here, um, this is, I think is a really kind of an interesting one we wanted to share because this kind of goes back to Laura's point about continuous improvement. Um, this uh, report actually lets us look at all the pages on our site. And if you're kind of looking at page views, you can see how many uh, people hit, you know, people uh, view each one of those. And you can kind of see where they come in and where they uh, fall off on the entrance and the exits. And what this has kind of really allowed us to do is kind of say, okay, if I've got X number of people on one page, and if it falls, you know, to a certain amount of people on the next page, I potentially know there's a hitch in my process, right? There, there's um, something that we need to refine page or content-wise that's causing our users to fall off. Okay, and this, uh, this next slide, um, this kind of goes to the heart of what, you know, Florida name changes for us. This is actually a graph that's showing if you guys look at that name change petition line on the left side. So you'll see like for our name change petition, our automated forms, you'll see how many opportunities we had, you know, then also how many people started the process of filling out the forms and how many people finished the process. Um, so this really kind of allows us on all of our, in our, our form types, like our name change petition, our social security, our US passport, this allows us to kind of monitor and actually make sure that people are using them and then also we can say at the end of the day, hey, you know, we've at this point helped almost 500 people complete name change packets and we can really kind of figure out what that real world value is, you know, to the legal aid world and to the user. And then this, uh, this last report I wanted to show you guys here, um, this is kind of, uh, this is basically a report that we built to kind of watch how our forms are actually being utilized and see how they're working. And I, I know it's a lot of data on here, um, but you'll see like on this, each line on here is a report, you know, or a particular automated form that exists for one of our sites. And then kind of you go to that middle section here, you can say, okay, here's the number of people that started this form. Here's the number of people that completed this form. And here's kind of that percentage, right? And ideally, we'd love to see people, you know, if somebody comes to a form, you know, we'd love to see 90 plus percent of the people completing them. But if, if it's something significantly lower than that, we can I use a report like this to identify issues that are going on with our process, and then we can work to continuously improve that, as you know, Laura stated earlier. And then kind of the, the cool thing about this is if we do find the report that we want to drill into and actually look into, we've actually got a similar uh, you know, drill in our sub-report that actually will show us the same information on a question by question level so we can actually really get in and uh, see what's going on with the form and see where a form is breaking. Okay, and then um, the last thing that we kind of wanted to talk to you guys um, about is uh, we're currently working, um, I know Laura primarily is working um, on a Drake equation uh, formula that we're doing for uh, within Side Florida Justice Technology Center. And this is kind of going to be a consistent methodology that we apply to all of our projects. And you'll, we'll kind of show you how it's working for Florida Name Change here in a second. But the idea is that we want to say, okay, we've got a target audience for this site. Let's figure out how many people from that audience can realistically find our site and use it. And then we kind of track them to the process and say, okay, how many people actually came to the site? And then how many people used our form? So it's kind of like a funnel. You know, we're looking at our target users and we're trying to figure out how, we, how much people we help and then how much, many people action the site. Okay, so this um, this slide here, this is kind of the, the first slide here for kind of our little Drake equation we did for Florida name change. And in this case, we asked a really simple question, right? We asked how many people that come to our site complete both a name change and a gender marker update. So this is gonna be a certain segment of our site. And then if you kind of look at our, uh, our chart down here at the bottom, you'll see that we started with right 100,000 transgender you know, individuals live in Florida. Then on the next line, we're saying, well, okay, well, how many of those individuals are going to do some type of a transition surgery where we can actually help them, you know, change their gender marker? And we came to the conclusion, conclusion well, that's going to be 25% um, based on research. And then if further to reduce it, we said, okay, uh, the, uh, the percent of people that um, actually have had a surgery to transition to another gender, how many people have not changed their documentation yet? And we said, okay, that's 58%. So Right off the bat here, we know that we've got about, you know, 14,500 people that right now in Florida, that's a potential audience for our site. 
And then at the bottom, we, we ask some other simple questions like how many of them understand English well enough to use the site, 93%, and how many of them do we think um, will actually be able to find our site, you know, using a mobile phone or a computer library or something like that. And we came down to we've got about a 13,000 person tar target audience for the site. And then, so kind of this, uh, the next piece here, there's, uh, now that we still have said, okay, we've got a 13,000 person target audience, now we're actually going back and we're, we're seeing what's happened on the site and you know, trying to figure out how many of those people are actually reaching. Um, so like in this particular case on this grid, we've had 8,200 individuals come to the site since we launched it. 36% um, of those on the next line are ones that actually um, have done paperwork that includes a gender marker change. So then in that particular case, we know that we've um, had about 3,000 potential people, right, come to the site that actually is our target audience for this scenario. And then kind of looking at the bottom here, we also know that of those 3,000 people, 177 people have fully gone through the process of actually doing a gender marker change. And then, um, so this is a really easy thing for us to say that in this particular case, 13,000 person target audience we know that 177 of them have actually gone through and completed the paperwork. We know that we've already helped potentially 1.3% of our target audience. And, that, and that's something that we can really look at and say, yes, you know, we are positively impacting the justice gap. And then uh, this is the last thing I wanted to kind of show you guys too, is the last kind of part of our Drake equation formula is trying to figure out and what those positive outcomes are from our site and attract them. And in this particular case, this is a work in progress. Um, so these are not hard numbers that you know that we're, we're publishing at this point. But this is kind of an in progress look to give you guys an idea, you, the idea how, kind of how we're measuring this. Um, so the first thing we kind of wanted to show is, you know, what's the potential amount of hours and you know um, and and uh, money are we actually saving legal aid organizations, you know, by being able to help people with a site like this? And what we kind of came to on here is you'll see. Um, you know, 1.75 1, 1. hours and, you know, a full case like this will potentially save a legal aid organization. And we're kind of also estimating that we'll save them, you know, $70 an hour for that time. And so if you kind of look at the bottom here, you know, you'll see that we've potentially saved, you know, close to $25,000 with a tool like this. And even using kind of in-progress estimates to, that we're still working on. But, it, but there's also some social um, factors here as well. So if you kind of look at those bottom three white lines on our grid, um, you know, 32% of the people, uh, transgender people are actually denied services or attacked, you know, based on, you know, their genders not matching in their IDs or people have been asked to leave establishments and things like that. So those are also things that we're tracking. And you'll see that we've, you know, potentially saved you know, at the bottom there in the blue, 64 people from being denied services or attacked. You know, we've actually saved 18 people potentially from being asked to leave an establishment by actually helping people complete this process. Um, so even though this is kind of a work in progress, these are some very powerful, you know, statistics that we're starting to put together for this tool and other tools where we can really tell the story of, you know, of what this actually looks like and how we're helping the legal, you know, uh, gap. And um, that's pretty much all that I had for you guys on this scenario. I know it was kind of fast um, and I'm definitely, uh, there's a lot of material there. And definitely, um, definitely open, open answering questions and kind of revisiting this with anybody that, you know, wants to talk about it. Terrific. Thanks so much, Brandon. Um, and just a bit of a mention for the Drake equation. Um, so that's a national effort that we are working with in combination with a bunch of uh, both legal service organizations and research providers, including Pew and RAND and folks like that. Um, and there will be relatively soon, within the next month or two, um, some um, kind of more outcomes as to how, what it is and how you might be able to use it for things like this. So kind of an early look as, as we experiment with what it's useful for. Uh, but for those who are intrigued by this uh, sneak peek, um, there will be more coming soon. Any questions or thoughts um, for Brandon before we look at um, where we go to Zach's case study? Thank you so much, Brandon. That was so 
very interesting. Um, Zach, um, start, can we um, uh, give uh, Zach the control? Uh, Zach should have control. Okay. Is that coming up? Does everyone see the Illinois Armed Forces Legal Aid Network? Yes, website? indeed. Thank you. Okay, great. So, um, just to give you a bit of an overview of what this all is, uh, the Illinois Armed Forces Legal Aid Network was created by a state law, and the law did a few things. It authorized a filing fee, that's $2, that funds the project, which works out to about $1.4 million a year on all civil filings. It created an oversight council appointed by a variety of state and uh, legal aid agencies, which I staff. And it kind of sketched out the idea of what we were going to build, which was a statewide hotline and network of providers to assist veterans, active duty military, National Guard and Reserves with their civil legal problems. So what you're looking at now is our, is our website. Um, and so we were tasked with this mission as the Illinois Equal Justice Foundation. And the first thing we thought we would do would be to uh, figure out what the heck's going on. <laughs> we did not know much about this, so we conducted a needs assessment. And this is part of evaluation and baking in metrics because in addition to asking what's going on, we also asked what's important, what's worth measuring, why are we measuring it, what are you already measuring, and who are our constituencies. So we talked to hundreds of people across the state, organizations that were and were not working with veterans, organizations that were purposefully working with veterans, and organizations that just happened to be. We thought about our constituency. Um, this came from the state, so we wanted to be mindful of our state legislatures. So we knew early on that something we want to keep track of, for example, would be where clients were coming from, were they in different legislative districts, so we could show impact in those districts and make a case for continued funding. Um, in the course of our needs assessment, we also learned about the kinds of legal problems we expected to see, and that also informed the kinds of questions and monitoring and evaluation we want to do. For example, we found out early on that we were likely to get a lot of requests for VA benefits appeals and discharge upgrades, which we do. And a discharge upgrade means you've exited the military and you have a characterization of service. Most people get what's called honorable. Then there's dishonorable at the bottom, and in the middle are a whole bunch of other things. And depending on which one of those you get, you may or may not be eligible for services. So we looked at those two that we were probably going to be handling a fair number of cases in, that, in those areas of law. And we started thinking about what it meant to be doing that work. For example, uh, they take years sometimes to complete. So we want to know output and outcomes, but we also want to know caseload and capacity. So we started wanting to keep track of how many of these cases are people on our network actively building because it takes a lot of time and effort. How many have they actually filed? How many have they actually won, of course? And for some of these cases, when you win, you get a benefit, you get cash. So we want to keep track of that. How much money do we earn for our clients or secure for our clients? Uh, but with some of these cases, you can actually lose but still win a benefit in the sense that you might not get money, but you might get access to better health care. So learning about this through the needs assessment process, we realized we should keep track of those sorts of outcomes as well. So key lesson number one that we've learned um, was kind of thinking about this stuff early on. We also had that oversight council, and they made the great point that we should keep track of whether or not there is a nexus between the legal problem that's presenting and the military service, because we're focused on that population. So we got a project. We have a sketched out idea from the legislature, and we've done a needs assessment. But the next thing to do would be to get our partners, members, and affiliates together and try and figure out how we're going to standardize this data collection, sort of setting the ground rules. You can see here uh, the members who've received funding and then affiliates. We've actually had three organizations ask to join. Don't even ask for money. They're just so excited about what we're doing, which is a pretty cool thing. Um, to give you the lay of the land, we started out with nine organizations. Now we're at 13. Three of those organizations are funded by the Legal Services Corporation, so they come with those restrictions and different requirements. Uh, others are not Legal Services Corporation funded. Some of them, six I think, use Legal Server as their case management tool. Three don't. Our hotline, which is Carpels, uses Salesforce as its primary case management system. And then a couple of our law school clinics actually use a product called Smokeball, which nobody else used. So <laughs> knowing all that, we had to think, how on earth are we going to standardize this and make it so that we're gathering relevant, useful data in a standardized way? What you're looking at now is our basic intake document. And we created this as a group. We got together over several meetings, and we really talked through what are we already collecting, 
what do we think we should be collecting given the needs assessment and their experiences in the room what would be worth collecting and we try to make it as minimal of an intrusion into their normal procedures as possible so we had to add some stuff we added things called military service to your basic intake and we set this as a floor if an LSC funded program needs to collect more information they're allowed to go over but at a minimum they needed to collect this so that we knew what was going on um, so we have military specific questions like branch and rank and then we also have an AFLAN ID, and that's a new tool that we created to help us track movement through our system. It's a, it's a unique identification number that we can use to deduplicate results and also look at how people move through our providers. So that took a lot of work, and uh, I'm not going to lie to you, we're not perfect. We're still working on training staff. We're still working on getting everyone on the same page, still working on the best methods to improve the um, ways in which people use their their case management system to collect this information, but it, it's, it's doing a lot. Um, and when you get stuff like branch of service early on in this process, as, as Laura was mentioning, you can start looking at trends earlier on as well. So when I crunch these numbers, I can see in real time, and I'll show you that in a minute, that we're not reaching as many National Guardsmen as I think we could be. So that's a nice way to see right, re really quickly on what the value of the standardized intake is. In addition to talking intake and sort of basic data collection at the front end, which is sort of the start, we also talked early on about the back end, which are outcomes. What you're looking at now is the application for funding to be part of this project. So it's the, it's the actual application. It's not the back end stuff. It's before you even become part of the network. There's a fair warning here, and it says you don't have to fill these out now, but a year from now, we're going to ask you to tell us what you learned. And these were also a product of collaborative conversations across all the different organizations that would likely be a part of the project. Um, we really wanted to say, what are you already doing? What are you not doing? Um, what would be too much of a pain in the butt to do? Uh, what's reasonable given the constraints? And this, uh, an example here that I mentioned earlier would be VA benefits. So I said that it takes a long time, so we can keep track of how many are being investigated, how many have been filed, how many are at various stages in the appeals process, and then we keep track of benefits that have been uh, gained from a previously denied claim, increased benefits, and as I mentioned before, you can get non-economic benefits. So if you didn't necessarily win, but you now get medical care, that's something we want to keep track of. So this outcome conversation happened early on as well, and it really allowed us to up everyone's game a couple programs did things like making financial outcome fields mandatory in their outcome measurements in legal server. So even if the answer is zero, they still have to put something in, and that greatly increased their um, capture of the economic impact that their work has. Others reformatted things so that they had a primary outcome and then optional secondary outcomes instead of having five primary outcomes that created a confusing report. So what you're going to see now is the kind of middle part of this process. We've talked about the intake, and we've talked a little bit about the outcomes, and what you're looking at now is a, a platform, a portal built on the Salesforce platform, and what this is is where our hotline lives. So when you call our hotline right now, about 65% of the time, an attorney who's staffing that hotline solves your problem completely over the phone. They provide brief advice, they provide uh, assistance filling out forms, they have provide self-help materials and directions, and they run down documents from the court, all kinds of stuff. So 65% of the time, it's done in one and done right there at the phone. Uh, about uh, five minutes to talk to a lawyer right now, given our current wait times, and that's with about 800 calls a month. That's inclusive of recurring calls. So in terms of that quick data, again, what you're looking at now is each program in the network and their accept or reject rate. So I can take a quick scan and see right away who's not accepting a lot of cases and who is accepting a lot of cases and who is an aberration given the kind of general status in the network. That allows us to get some pretty cool reports. So that data, that standard basic intake comes through here. Oops, sorry, the wrong button. And each member of the network has access to this. And so they're able to take a look at um, their program itself, which is what you're seeing load now. So on the left-hand side is the program itself, and on the right-hand side is the, the region of the network in which they work, so in this case, Cook County. So CDLS, Chicago Volunteer Legal Services, they can look on the right-hand side and say, okay, almost 1,200 cases in Cook, and on the left-hand side, they say, we've received 161 referrals. Drilling down further, I don't want to go through all this in too detail, but it's, it's a lot of information taken, um, but you can also see, for example, that in Cook County, family law is about 20% of the cases that the network's receiving. 
but for this program for CVLS, it's nearly 45%. So we can see right away that they're receiving a whole lot of the family law cases as a percentage of their caseload. And I, I'm going to go to a PDF, I'm sorry, a PowerPoint now. This is because what you're looking at is my version of that platform, and since I'm not a service provider, I, I can't uh, receive referrals. But this is what it looks like to receive referrals. And this is, again, a, a moment where we standardized and without a whole lot of um, need to change standard procedures, created a network based model that allows us to really analyze the data. So these, these codes here are for when you receive a referral, you've accepted a referral, and you're closing out the case. And they, they're, those are standardized across funders in Illinois. So everyone's familiar with them, and they understand what they mean. Uh, you know, that's so you've closed it out, you've provided services, what level of service, you weren't able to provide a complete service because the client withdrew or something else happens, so there's codes for that. Similarly, with denied service, um, you know, give a reason for that. And all that gets fed into this analytics program and allows us to really see what's going on nearly in real time, but also um, in a way that provides opportunities to look for trends and other issues. So I'll give this just a second as the analytics loads. There we go. So you're looking at now is anything that came from the hotline and to a provider. So you see 36% referral rate. You can see the problem codes and categories here in the middle. Big bucket, middle bucket, little bucket. Veterans uh, benefits is our biggest case and biggest bucket. Of that, it's they're looking for an upgrade in military discharge. So this allows us to really clearly look through right away and see what's going on with the network. If in the middle here, I can see who didn't accept a referral. So I can click on that and get a live view that shows me right away whether or not referrals are being accepted or rejected. And we're now sorting just for rejects. And I can see that they're mostly in veterans' benefits. Second most are in divorce. So looking down, I can see which provider rejected those um, veterans' benefits or divorce cases and why. Those codes that were part of the referral process I showed you in the PowerPoint. So we've got conflict of interest, insufficient merit. Um, and when you sort for insufficient merit, drilling down even further, it now becomes clear that the reason those rejections are coming through and are being marked insufficient merit and their veterans' benefits, it's most likely or not people who really aren't eligible for an upgrade, but they're desperate and they're giving it a shot anyways. And so one of the things the network provides is the peace of mind and the closeout sort of understanding. You've been running in circles for a long time. You've heard of this mythical discharge upgrade. It doesn't apply to you, and here's why. And so that's another kind of outcome that we can track, whether it doesn't feel like a traditional legal aid outcome, but knowing that there's the peace of mind factor there is really important. That was a lot of information very quickly um, to sort of recap and summarize. I guess what I'd say is we really tried to think about what we wanted to collect and why, what would be burdensome, onerous, or not burdensome on people. How could we do that in a way that crosses different platforms and methodologies that are already in place? And then how can we use a little bit of new technology, which is the Salesforce platform, to sort of tie it together and create a, a balanced product that isn't uh, driving people nuts to be a part of and is actually providing them with valuable insight about how their network and the programs themselves work. So that's Il Aflan in a nutshell, the Illinois Armed Forces Legal Aid Network in a nutshell. I was hopeful we'd get some questions, so I'll stop talking there and keep my fingers crossed. <laughs> I actually have at least one question for you, Zach. I'm, I'm curious, as we're looking at this, it's clear that there is just an enormous amount of uh, thought and functional design that went into deciding which metrics to show and how to show them. Can you talk a little bit about the process as to kind of how you did that and how long that took and what kind of, was that a hugely substantial lift? Is it beyond the, the realm of many organizations or not so much? Well, it, it's either, <laughs> either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. We were forced to use a variety of platforms and be aware of a variety of um, financial constraints. So when you look at the Salesforce thing, uh, what was lucky here was that the hotline was already using it, and so it was a minimal cost to add on to this. And in terms of what we could add to this data reporting suite, this visualization, we're really just limited by uh, screen real estate. We can keep adding uh, areas as long as we're collecting them, and we're collecting them via that standardized intake and closeout codes. So this can keep growing and growing. Um, on our end as the foundation, as the funder, we talked about some of the outcomes we put into the application and the eventual final reporting. And so people are being made aware of this early on so they can build that into legal server or in some cases keep track in a separate Excel document. So uh, to sort of answer your question, we 
we focused on what we thought was important and we're learning. We're, we're learning because we're only a year into this. We really just started our second year. And as we move through this, we've become aware of different aspects of this that really have an impact. For example, I'm looking at our senior section here. Um, we talked through people in the program about halfway through and they said, you know, I'm doing a whole lot of this work and it's really not getting captured by what you're doing. And given that almost everyone was already capturing that in some way, it didn't really add a lot of inconvenience to anyone to add that into our existing collection of data to sort of drive home the fact that we turned out we were serving a lot of seniors, um, a lot of, of Vietnam era veterans. So adding that in wasn't a big deal and we did it again in, in consultation. Fantastic. Other questions for Zach? I will save my, uh, I can ask infinite questions, but I will, um, <laughs> I will save my other questions for, for our panel. So your, your data kind of dashboard that you have there, um, how much of that is just pulled from Salesforce and how much of that is pulled from external sources, um, like the legal ser server or other uh, data sources? That is a great question. I'll, I'll show you the warts and all to this. So what I'm going to pull up now is when you take everything from all sources and combine it, and we are still working on getting our standardization down pat. Um, Actually, let me start with this, sorry. So this is a case management report. When we started this out, we envisioned it as being a hotline-centric driven kind of operation. It turns out that a lot of veterans like going to the Veterans Administration for their health care and other reasons. And so we have medical legal partnerships at a few sources. So we have about 75% of our clients come to us through the hotline, and about 25% or so come to us as direct walk-ins. So to manage that, I showed you that standardized basic intake and then we created this uh, Excel document, which is a template, which everyone puts all of their information in using these standardized values. And then we feed that back into Salesforce. We're working very hard at the moment to come up with some automated fixes for this, because it is a little bit cumbersome. Um, but to again meet people halfway, you'll see some things where there's a direct list of, of choices, like employment status. Those are the choices. So everyone uses those, and we have a standardized list. But for some other things, we said use your case management system codes. It's not worth trying to dig in. It's easy enough to convert. The biggest and most uh, you know, challenging example of that is legal problem codes. Um, when someone closes out a case, they use their own case management system code. And we, on the back end, created a mapping tool to roughly calculate whose problem codes correlate with whose. And then what that gives you then here is the full network report. Um, and so it's not quite as good as it could be yet because we just finished our first year and some people didn't quite use the templates right or there were minor errors and we're still cleaning the data. Um, but to answer your larger question, we're pulling it in from everywhere with an eye towards eventually and not too long in the future, really automating the process by which this information moves in. Um, there's a lot of opportunity with Salesforce with APIs. We've been, we've been trying some stuff with legal server and we're getting closer to some solutions there. And then for some of those non-legal server, non-Salesforce providers of case management software, um, you know, trying to figure out if there's an API opportunity there as well. Excellent. Fantastic. Um, sir, if you want to um, send control over to me, I will talk a little bit about what we are doing in Ohio. No problem. Uh, you should be, should have the option to be presenter now. Fantastic. Hang on a second. Great. All right, let me talk a little bit about the, the new <laughs> Ohio Legal Health. Um, so we've been talking about it in this way because there is actually a site if you go to the OhioLegalHealth.org, um, but we are only somewhat affiliated with it. So the project that, um, that I am working with, I am working with um, the, um, oh, actually it actually would be an important thing to put on the slide. Um, so that the site is being built by the, uh, by OLAW, the uh, Ohio Legal Assistance Foundation, which is the IOLTA founder in Ohio. Um, so we are building something that is a completely new, uh, will be a new statewide website. Um, we are in the midst of, we are finishing design and we're beginning the development um, for a launch about, around the quarter, quarter two of 2018. Um, it's a pretty ambitious site, um, and thus the, um, the, the timeline. So we've been using all the way along the path um, a lot of 
uh, data and research to create a um, uh, something that is very user-centered, um, very mobile-centric. Um, and we've also really had an eye towards how we will gather data for future decision maker making. So I thought it might be useful to you guys to show this in process. So rather than a fancy dashboard, um, what I have is, sorry, not to denigrate anybody else, it's an extremely fancy dashboard with a really impressive. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to, what, what we have essentially a set of requirements is what we are thinking through as we are, so we've, I've been saying, hey, we should, it, you should think about this in the design phase as to what you should build in. Well, this is what we are thinking about in the design phase as to what we should build in. And in fact, it's, it's not yet uh, finalized as to what we will build in. It's a set of requirements rather than a set of finalized um, features. Um, so in general, kind of just understanding um, what we're looking to track. So the, the site is, um, the general model of the site is probably fairly familiar to those of you who are familiar with things like Illinois Legal Aid Online or Michigan Legal Health. Um, it is very, what we're looking at here is a topic page, um, and we get a little better look at it on the next page. Um, it is a, it's very centralized around the idea of having about, uh, at launch, probably about 200 different topic pages, like get your security deposit back might be one. Um, and there are different sections that you can expand um, which, with um, understanding the basics. Uh, here, I'll show you the actual screenshots and talking about it. Uh, understanding the basics, letters and forms, legal health and lawyers, et cetera. So the whole site is kind of centered around this um, with the idea that, um, that there also is obviously a way for people to navigate to them. But our assumption is that this will be going directly here from um, both Google and we're going to be providing direct short links to appropriate topic pages to providers. Um, so this would be a slightly weird one. But I could imagine, like, for instance, we might have a topic page for veterans benefits um, or specific sub-details of that. And that might be a, something that um, we would be providing to veterans groups um, to get folks that they're working with straight there as opposed to making them navigate the home page. So that's the site, what the site is. Um, so in general, as we're thinking about this, we're thinking through all right, what do we want to track? We want to track who has visited the page, so who's found it at all, the percent who took the key action, who took key actions that imply some kind of engagement while they were there. This is really tricky on a website to try to understand whether somebody actually led or did anything on a page. Um, thinking through who took a next action, who did anything uh, that was useful after uh, looking at it. Uh, people who found it helpful is a little bit iffy in terms of uh, a metric. Um, uh, it's actually unclear as to whether it will make a cut to go in the site to do kind of a thumbs up, thumbs down, but we're somewhat interested in experimenting it and just to see how useful it is. Uh, and percent who took actual action down the road. And for all of these things, to try to find the right balance between you know, everything that might possibly be useful, um, which is, I think, all too often we kind of throw Google Analytics on a website and say, all right, well, we'll figure out later what we want to track. Um, that both, it has a couple of downsides. One, not everything is then feasible that you might want to do because of the way that you've implemented. Like, there might be some ways that it might be, be things that are easier to do up front that are then a pain down the road be because you just threw it on without thinking about your metrics. You then also have just a ton of raw statistics that may not really be very feasible to use. So thinking through, all right, what's feasible to build, but also we're not going to have very many staff. We're going to have limited resources to actually look at this data. So there's no point having just overwhelming quantities of data about everything on the site because we won't be able to take action on that. 
Um, so to think through, all right, what's this, you know, overlapping uh, thing of everything in the universe, <laughs> but it's also feasible to build and feasible to use. So what has this resulted as we have we've gone through this thought exercise? So for the topic page itself, um, so the number of visitors uh, for each topic page is a fairly straightforward one that makes sense. Um, the referral path, sorry, this is all fairly jargony because it was an internal document that I kind of uh, captured here. Uh, the referral path is where the visitor has come from when they get um, uh, on their way to get to this topic page. Um, the quiz is a specific functionality on our site, um, external search engine, something else. Bounce rate. Um, so this is the number of people who come to the page and then very and immediately leave the page or very quickly leave the page. Um, so that's often a good, um, very kind of reasonable, not a great measure, but a decent measure of people who, uh, for whom the page is not at all what they were looking for. Um, so it's basically, it doesn't really tell you whether it was useful for what it was intended for. It tells you that it was not what they had intended to do. Um, the um, design of our site has a really big metrics benefit, which is we have each of these, there's in fact four uh, what we're calling drawers with expandable headers. So there's this understanding the basics. Um, obviously, this, this is Greek in, what you're looking at is not, not clearly a live text with uh, Latin. It is a, um, a design. Um, and this will be a uh, small blurb to help you know what you might want to know. Um, and you can click read more to read, you know, a page, less than a page to help you understand this topic. Or you can click read more to see letters or forms. You can click read more to get legal help lawyers. Um, it has a huge benefit for um, uh, metrics because we can track how many people click to read more. Um, so we can know who did some engaging uh, with the page. Um, another one, uh, we're inter and I don't know whether this will be feasible. This is not a trivial one to do through Google Analytics. I'm um, oh, sorry, I skipped one. But uh, actually, both, neither of these are trivial through Google Analytics. Um, we're interested in anybody who uses any of these buttons, so who texts this themselves or email this or links this uh, or sends themselves the link, um, or people who click through on any content um, that isn't navigation. So they basically they click on a link within understanding the basics, or they click on a form, or they click on a lawyer. Percent who say it's helpful, thumbs up, left, thumbs down. Um, and we are very hopeful to implement a SMS follow-up um, to be able to capture in a key place in the site um, whether or not they're willing to uh, tell us what happened down the road um, and to capture a phone number and to be able to send them an SMS survey like two or three weeks after. Uh, it remains to be seen whether that will be in phase one. Uh, but that is, um, so those of you who are paying careful attention will notice that my um, uh, list of things we're looking to track uh, looks suspiciously similar to what we talked about for the Drake equation with name change. Uh, it's not accidental um, that we actually took the, uh, the Drake equation as, as kind of a model for how we might do that. And the SMS is one of the only things we could come up with as a way to know what actually happens in the world um, after they are on the site. So just uh, two more pages. Um, for the home page, uh, so here's the home page for the site, which is, um, again, we're not thinking of as nearly as critical a page on the site as um, the topic page. So, and it's also, honestly, there's not that much on it. Um, there's not that much um, here other than simply this list of categories. Um, so the number of visitors, the, now each of these starts a, what we're calling a mini quiz. So when you click on money, taxes, and debt, it goes into a, um, uh, a process of asking you some questions to try to determine what topic page um, you should go to and, and collect if you're willing to share information about your income and, and geography. And bounce rate, so people who come and then immediately leave. We're also interested in just the standard Google and analytics stuff, like for instance, where Google thinks they are, so the geolocating, uh, new versus repeat. So some of the things that Brandon show you, showed you for the 
uh, that they can cite. Um, and then forms. Um, so like we talked about for name change, forms are a great opportunity to actually understand more um, for a couple of reasons. One, you have things like uh, people who start and people who finish. Um, so you can actually know whether they've engaged with a form because they're actually moving through a form. Um, potentially, as a, again, like the other way people say it's helpful to send to people who click on any content link. This is actually for a different kind of form. Um, the, um, and here, um, an SMS follow-up might be particularly appropriate and useful because they're filling out information we can uh, understand uh, or we can collect from them potentially a phone number. There's a good, a good place to ask if we can follow up um, and collect their phone number. Um, so, and maybe there's more than one to say they filed the form, say they got a, a good outcome afterwards. All right. So that is Ohio legal help in all its glory, um, or at least our requirements for the metrics of it. Um, are there any questions specific to Ohio legal help um, before we, this would be also a great time to ask via chat any uh, questions to put to kind of this whole group, potentially including myself, um, in a kind of a panel discussion. Any questions on Ohio before I kick us off with uh, some kind of overall questions? Maybe I, I so will I, ask. So what, what platform are you building Ohio Legal Help on? Uh, off of Drupal. OK. And is it a custom Drupal or the DLaw template? It's a custom Drupal. OK. Um, why did you guys end up uh, making that choice? Um, so it, it is a more complicated site than could easily be supported on any of the templated sites. Mm -hmm. um, Drupal uh, felt like it, it certainly was complicated. It certainly was sophisticated enough to support our needs, and it feels like there's a fair critical mass of developers in the legal aid space and outside the legal aid space. In fact, we have a, a developer who has not uh, been doing a lot of work in legal aid. Um, there's a critical mass of developers who can help with it. Um, so it felt like uh, something that we knew that we could get support with. Excellent. Thank you. Terrific. All right. So a first question, and maybe I'll start with, with you, Zach. So if you think about um, an organization with, you know, as we all do, a pretty limited time and budget, who is currently in kind of a project-based build and then evaluate um, mode, where might you suggest they start? What might be small steps to try to move to this more baked-in metrics model? Zach, what do you think? I like to start with people working on the front lines, like intake staff, paralegals, people like that, they see trends and they can tell you trends that you're not seeing because it's not necessarily being reported already, but it can really inform what you might want to think about more systematically measuring or what, what you're doing well, but you should be formalizing because your program has a sense of it, but you couldn't at the end of a year or something run a report and tell a funder this is what's happened. So I think in terms of just an easy, quick fix, um, talking to some of the people we don't always necessarily talk to, but who actually have quite a bit of a, a, a kind of bird's eye view, if you will, of how a project's working. Uh, and so basically thinking of that as your kind of interim cycle. Um, so basically to say, all right, after we're going to roll something out and in two months we're going to ask the people on the front lines how it's working. That's right, yeah, and we did that with the Illinois Armed Forces Legal Aid Network. We, we launched this portal that, as you say, is very fancy looking, um, but it wasn't perfect right out of the gate, right? I mean, we, we, we solicited and heard quite a bit of feedback, and some of that was just basic, you know, website design and improvements around user interface and things like that. But some of it was, hey, um, we talked long and hard about these closing codes for a case or these incomplete codes when we don't finish providing services to a client, but now that we've done this for two months, we're really missing this. Um, people, for example, we were c capturing information about their discharge status, 
and that's important for a variety of reasons, but people found out that in practice, you could tell that someone, this is a bit of a double negative, did not have a, a dishonorable discharge. So because of the services they were getting, you knew they weren't prohibited from them because they didn't have a dishonorable discharge, but you didn't know what other characterization service they had because it was a family member calling on their behalf or their papers had long been lost, but you knew they had at least above that level because they, they were getting some other services. And so now we're capturing that in a way that's meaningful and it tells us, um, you know, you, they might otherwise accidentally get lumped in the wrong category. Yep, absolutely. Great. And Brendan, do you have any thoughts as to kind of what you would advise for an organization who's trying to think through just kind of a place to start? Yeah, I mean, I mean, honestly, I, th I think we've kind of co covered a lot of it. I do like the idea that uh, if you're working in a with a project and you're gathering a requirement, I think you do need to be as intentional about the reporting requirements as you are about everything else. I mean, it really is just as important as to your point, you know, earlier on. It's not. It really shouldn't be an afterthought. You really should plan for this all throughout the process and measure whenever you can. Um, one of the things that I kind of like kind of coming from a kind of background in the corporate world in my previous life is I do like the idea of um, a lot A lot of times um, you kind of have to force yourself to be intentional about baking things in where you can action it. I've always liked the idea of, you know, potentially using triggers or things like that or highlights in reports to where you're saying that, you know, if something goes above or below a certain threshold that we don't, we find that to be not acceptable, that, that it triggers, you know, to somebody and say, you know, it says, hey, you know, you don't have to just go through reporting to figure this, these things out. You know, I'm going to bring it to your attention. And I, I do think for some small organizations, those type of triggers or thresholds or highlighting lines can be very important to actually um, be able to proactively action a lot of these insights, you know, the, the type of reports and metrics we show them. Yep. I, can I just say, I, I like that a lot, and I think you're completely right. And in my work as a funder, we work with um, organizations that provide just legal information and kind of like know your rights seminars, for example. And these are often small organizations focused on a very specific population, and they have very small budgets. And so to look for those triggers, as you put it, we sometimes suggest just give people a quick one to five on the way out of the door from a know your rights seminar and say, like, you know, how much did you learn, one to five? It's not going to tell you a lot. But if someone's at a one consistently, one of your trainers, everyone's hovering at two and a half and everybody else is at a three and a half, you know something's gone wrong. So at the very least, it's a, it's a trigger and it, it costs next to nothing. It's just some hash marks on a sheet of paper or print out a couple pages with one to five on it and have people circle it. But it, as, as a broad sort of aberration noticing tool, it really does a lot. Hmm. Nice. Yeah, and it, I would add on to that. It seems that this idea of a trigger sounds also very useful for the realm of deciding what to track and basically thinking through, all right, we're going to start out by saying, all right, there, we're going to have three data points that we're going to start by measuring for this particular project and to say, all right, what would be the data points that would trigger action? You know, what would be things that if we fell below X or if that went, this went over, you know, Y would be things that would make us Mm -hmm. decide something or do something differently because logically it doesn't uh, collecting data about things that you have no intention to do anything about um, is mostly a waste of time <laughs> in my, in my opinion. <laughs> right. so you yeah, should right. know what you're looking to do with it um, and so basically starting by all right, what is most important for us to do something about mm -hmm. um, might be a really interesting way to start. <clears throat> All right, another question for the panel. Um, so as you think through, so I feel like for a lot of the organizations who have trouble transitioning to this kind of, of thinking, some of the fundamental issue is trying to convince people who are, have, have a somewhat less than rosy view of the value of data to begin with, to basically you know, there are potentially are folks on the front lines who say, you know, no, no data can capture the value of what I do every day or, you know, all the way up to an executive director who says, you know, data is a necessary evil, but it's like it's not, not useful to me. It's just something that I'm collecting for a funder. Um, do you have any 
arguments that you found compelling um, in this particular realm to basically say, you know, here's a, a, a good reason why data is not just a necessary evil, but is something that is very useful for you? Either one of you want well, to jump in? Sure, yeah. I mean, speaking as a funder, um, <laughs> we, we, um, we, we've, uh, you saw some of our outcome collection in that application page, and we're starting to focus in on that pretty heavily. And so I don't think it's a necessary evil, but what, but we're making it clear to people that you're living in an age where this stuff is becoming more expected and more standard. So we look at our projects and our funded organizations uh, in comparison to their peers. You know, we have limited funds. And so um, in a world where it's more possible to collect this stuff, it, it tells us a lot about relative performance across different projects. So one organization in one funding category versus another organization in another funding category. It may not be exactly apples to apples, but it's pretty close. And um, you know, we've used that to show them the value of collecting this so they can be competitive for grants. We also receive our money from the state of Illinois. Even, you know, we're, we're the state's commitment to legal aid funding. So we take that data back to the state legislature and we show the impact that it has. And we show the, the local legislators from the areas where those legal aid organizations work, the impact of their work. And that, that really does a lot because they'll hear anecdotal things about, you know, their staff at the local office gets a phone call from someone who needs help with a legal problem. And, you know, they just transferred them over to the local LSC funded program. They couldn't do it because of this. And so they kind of have, you know, what they have in their head is what they're hearing from their, their local staff. But we can show them a customized report built to their general area showing them the impact that these programs are having with financial data and things like that. And that's another one where we found that um, some organizations weren't really keen on that financial outcome measurement. They thought it was a kind of a pain in the butt. But when they look at it in the aggregate, the attorneys were actually really proud because no one had ever given them that snapshot before where you say, look, you guys in this housing um, practice group, when you, you add up the value of all the homes you save from foreclosure or what have you, it, it's in the millions of dollars. That's an impressive feature. Of, of what you're working on. So th that kind of stuff really can be inspiring too, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and I would would love that. So certainly data is really critical to communicate impact for funding purposes. So I, I'm not sure any of us would argue with that. But I would hate to leave an impression that that is the primary reason for it. Uh, because I sure. feel like there is also a, uh, a really, uh, so we have a, important mandate to be able to uh, improve what we are doing over time. And whether that, and that doesn't necessarily mean quantitative data, maybe that means interview data, or I'm actually a specialist in, in qualitative data, so things like user testing or interviews. Um, so it, it doesn't necessarily mean dashboards and metrics. But thinking through, I kind of feel like for some of the more naysayer data people um, to kind of, I, that I've worked with in the past, to try to think through, all right, what are meetings that you have that where you make decisions where things might be informed by having actionable data? What is that data? And that's sort of one or two things because it then starts to, to show its own work. That it's, once you have once you are sitting around wondering how something is going and you actually have some data to be able to, you know, inform that conversation, it can become a bit addictive. Um, so that can be a useful way to go. Yeah, and I would say too, Laura, coming from like an organization previously, I came from an organization that kind of looked, looked backwards most of the time originally where we did something and then we tried to assess what was going on. And I think I think experience with the data is honestly what really wins the weight the naysayers over you know over over time is the you know once you can keep saying hey we made this decision in the past you know we now analyze it that and we've seen some potential other ways we could have gone that would have been better so I think I think you can slowly you know win an organization over by looking backwards and then kind of proving out alternate paths and you can slowly get those people to turn to be more proactive over time. 
Could, Great. could you talk a little bit more about how um, you use this data in a larger communication strategy, um, either externally uh, with stakeholders or internally with individuals that you're funding? Like, how is um, what are some of the real use points that you have for it? Zach, you want to start with us? Sure. Um, yeah, well, as I was sort of saying before, we, we do really let organizations see kind of how they lay in the, in the larger legal aid landscape. Um, so in terms of cost per service and cost per person served and things like that, um, you can show them when a program running a similar project is much more cost effective than them, then you can start talking about why. Um, we've done stuff with programs where they, they really wanted to focus on a volunteer-based project, and when you look at it after the fact, they served you know, a good number of people, but at a greater cost and more complexity than maybe if they just had more staff attorney time or resources devoted to it. So we, we use it sort of to, obviously, to lobby for more funding from the state. We go to state legislators and talk about all the great impacts, but we also use it to refine some programming around the edges and sometimes at the core of the program where the model they've chosen, you know, isn't really the most effective one given the other options out there. Perfect. And that sort of answer, <laughs> sort of answer your question. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And Brandon, what about for Florida name change? How are you guys using that data? I mean, we're we're definitely using it. Um, I mean, we're kind of still refining our methodology and kind of what we're doing with it. But I think it's very useful from a communication standpoint. A lot of the things we're tracking to be able to say, hey, you know, this site is, like I said before, this site has helped us save 64 people from discrimination or, you know, for, you know, from being expelled from a place. You know, there's a lot of those, I think, those social, those quality of life aspects that once we kind of bake those type of things into the metrics, you know, those, those things are updated on a daily basis and the people that are doing the communications for us you know, with supporters or with stakeholders or other media outlets can then readily go to those type of statistics and really say, hey, this site is really doing some good things. And, you know, the, these are the things that are doing. And, hey, by the way, here's the numbers in real time. You know, we're not just saying we're doing this. We're, we're providing you updates with it. You know, and this is what's actually going on. I think that's a really good point. And I'd say that for a new project, it was useful for us to be able to re relatively quickly be able to get some good data up and out there to prove that we weren't just some fly-by-night, who the hell are these guys who sent you kind of organization, um, particularly given the population we're working with where there are a lot of, um, you know, less than reputable nonprofits that are trying to capitalize on an interest for veterans and things like that. So coming out of nowhere fresh and, and using that data to really bolster our reputation and demonstrate the quality of the work was really important for us for getting trust in the community. And I guess as a, as a follow-up, what is the, uh, for each of you, what was an example of one of the most surprising pieces of data that, that you got from collecting is this that you hadn't expected? I think with us from a, like from, from a Florida name change perspective, um, it's honestly just been eye-opening for us to actually see the impact the site was having. Um, one of the things we looked at up front uh, is I think there's normally like 6,100 name changes that take place in Florida in a year. And we saw that the transgender community was like 0.7% of the estimated population. So we were thinking, okay, you know, this maybe this site will do 50 name changes a year or something like that. We're, but we're helping a very vulnerable population. What's actually been kind of shocking and eye-opening to us with a lot of the metrics we've been looking at is, is I think that, that that community could potentially be a lot smaller than estimated because we're actually at the point now where we've, since we've launched in March, we've done nearly 500 name change packets. So, I mean, there were just a lot of, a lot of there's a lot of little things, that's a little thing, but there's a lot of things, honestly, in our metrics that have actually been quite eye-opening, you know, if we weren't really, you know, monitoring those things as closely. Yeah, and I'll actually add it. So I don't have any for Ohio, but I hope to do the drink analysis of name change because um, I'm also doing work in Florida. Um, so I'll just add in that multiplying through the even what is not very high numbers by the reports given by the I'm sorry the, the percentages given by research on like the amount of the number of people like attacked because they had an incongruous ID or denied service because their ID didn't match. It really, it just, um, 
provided a, a level of insight on those numbers that I hadn't really thought about before. That like, you know, these folks are every time they're presenting an ID, like they, you know, they go to the grocery store and try to buy beer and mm -hmm. it's this, you know, gauntlet of like I'm presenting this ID for a man but I look like a woman. Um, so just kind of, it really brought that home to me. So the, the idea of bringing it all the way through to those kind of, those would be some of the core metrics that really uh, are important to that type of analysis and really um, brought it home for me. Totally agree. We, I didn't show you our, our call volume metric page, but we tracked that very carefully. And so one of the first things that we weren't sure of is how many calls are we really going to get? We were worried we'd get either completely swamped or have nothing right out of the gate. And it started a little slow, but it, it built. But what we learned early on is that we'd done, and we could tell this because we track how long it takes someone for, for someone to hang up before they get to talk to a lawyer. And we were seeing a relatively quick abandon rate. They were, they were hanging up really quick. And we realized we hadn't done as good a job as we could have of really setting expectations and, and with both the partners that were referring people to that and in the way we communicated to our client population. So we've done a much better job of expressing to people, hey, when the phone's answered, you're going to hear an automated thing. But if you hang on, it'll tell you what to do. And usually in about five minutes, you're talking to a lawyer. Having that out there has really improved our abandon rate. Um, it's dropped quite a bit. You know, it was first off the gate, I think it was like in, in the first two minutes or something. When someone did abandon, they abandoned within the first two minutes. Now it's up to close to four. So it's nearly doubled the amount of time people are waiting. Um, and, you know, it's still a little frustrating, I guess, but it's pretty quick, five minutes or so. So that call volume stuff was a surpriser for us. We also had a, a law school clinic that's part of the network that has a really good reputation with veterans. Um, but they were, unfortunately, because they had such a good reputation, they're getting calls from all over about everything. And they really don't do everything. They do a couple things, and they do them very well. So they changed their voicemail, or, sorry, their phone system's message around to say, hey, here are the things we do. We'd love to help you with those. If you need anything else, go ahead and uh, press 1, and we'll connect you to this hotline. And they did that, and their call volume that they actually had to handle dropped by two-thirds which meant that their student attorneys and all the people working on all that intake time for essentially clients they couldn't assist was freed up. So it was a huge benefit to them. And that's, again, just because we realized right away we need to communicate better who does what, what to expect, and, and when you're calling and all that sort of thing. And, yeah, one of the most frustrating things is to get a hotline and uh, have to refer someone when that could have been something that they were listening to on the way in and already moving on to that service. That's right. Yeah, it's better for the, the client feels better about it. It's much quicker for them. And then, the, you know, those student attorneys, now they have hours of their day back where they're not doing in, essentially triaging improper referrals, more or less. We've kind of seen some uh, similar things, too, I know with some of the Florida name change reporting. Um, one of the things that we were kind of seeing in our data by tracking the, the page reporting, you know, and kind of following people through the flow you know, we were seeing that we were potentially we were losing the, almost a sixth of our, you know, visitors on our disclaimer page. And then we saw a case where we actually had a, a checklist page where we thought, hey, this is something really useful for people to print out and kind of use a checklist to follow through the process. And we saw what well, we were losing another, you know, sixth of our visitors on that page. So there was just little, some very unexpected things that we were kind of seeing in the flow and we're kind of still working to tweak those kind of things out. But, yeah, th those type of things can pretty happen to them like we're thinking well this is a great thing for the user experience but you might you know find that it's actually something that's tripping them up terrific and that's i think a nice note to end on just the idea that this this kind of idea of continual metric or not continual metrics which sounds scary um <laughs> but the idea of continual improvement um, can help you to refine things over time, you know, to find things that people are tripping up on, um, as opposed to just kind of one gigantic thing at the end, which is hard to use to, to refine much of anything. So, fantastic. Um, thank you so much for attending. Um, this has been really fun. Thank you so much to Zach and Brandon for joining me. It's been really great to uh, to hear more of what they're doing, um, and uh, thanks for having us. Thank oh, thank you so much. This this was great. Um, we will be sharing the video along with slides um, here in the next week, and on our new website. Um, please 
feel free to send us an email if you've got any questions or follow-ups. There'll be a short survey. Um, we're starting to put together our list of topics for next year's webinars um, for our uh, request for proposals. So if this is something uh, that you found valuable, please let us know. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.